this afternoon I will be discussing about optimal theory placement or distribution networks. So first, uh, uh, we must know what are the capabilities of the of the theories. So uh, news or micro theories provides real time synchronized measurements by the use of uh, global positioning uh, global positioning system. So this gives us better better uh, chance for studies in finding correlation in in our data. So uh, PMU can actually measure uh, voltage and uh, current. So these measurements include the magnitude and the phase angle. So as an example. Uh, as an example, uh, if we place uh, PMU in bus two and bus bus seven of this sample system, uh, we can directly measure the bus voltage at bus two and bus seven, as well as uh, the incident lines uh, line currents, both the magnitude and the phase angle. So, uh, I have shown you from the previous slide that we can measure directly. Uh, some of, uh, some values like the bus voltage and the uh, currents of the incident lines, and with Ohm's law, uh, it states the current loop a conductor between two points is directly proportional to the voltage across two points. With this, uh, uh, it gives us uh, uh, it actually states the relationship between the voltage and the current, which is. Uh, the proportionality concept would be our resistance or the impedance. So given given the impedance of the network is known, we can extend our observability from from let's say from bus two to its adjacent buses. Like for example, adjacent buses of bus two is buses one, three, nine, fifteen, and six and eight for for the PMU installed at bus seven. So Installing PMU at bus 2 and bus 7 gives us uh, um, the measurements from from other buses as well. So with this knowledge, we can see that it is not necessary for us to install PMU at all buses of our network. <clears throat> so it is actually an optimization problem, an optimal PMU placement problem. So ideally, uh, it is better for us to install PMU at all buses of the network, but realistically and economically, it may not be possible. So, our goal in optimal PMU placement is to make the system completely observable at minimum cost. Meaning of completely observable, meaning all the buses or states of the given system is uh, all the magnitude and phase angles of all all voltages of all buses are known. At the minimum cost, meaning it includes installation cost, maintenance, cost of communication, and etc. For my presentation, uh, I will be we we will be assuming uh, we'll be assuming uh, a cost of installing a PMU at, at any bus, the same at the same cost for any bus for simplicity. So the objective function is by minimizing the cost, wherein uh, W sub i is the actual cost in installing a PMU in in bus i, wherein wherein the the variable x sub i is the binary decision bar variable, wherein if we should install a PMU on that bus or not. So with this optimization, our constraints are actually given by the connectivity from seen from each bus. Let's say for example, from bus one, bus one is connected to bus two. So bus one can only be observed from, if you install a PMU from in bus one, or if you install a PMU in bus two. So looking at bus two, it could only be observed if you install a PMU in bus one, two, three, nine, and 15. So those are the constraints for this optimization problem. So, in in this optimization problem, there are practi practical considerations. This includes PMU outages, line outages, 
and PMU channel minis. So first, PMU outages, there might be cases of, uh, like for example, communication failure or PMU uh, failure. So uh, the formulation of this is easily done by increasing the observability needed for each bus. Like for example, earlier from the previous slide, uh, the constraint for bus three is actually at least one. But in this in this uh, in this slide, we increase it to to two, meaning uh, at least two PMUs must uh, observe uh, bus three. So in case of in case of one PMU outage, still bus three is observable. So uh, if you if you need uh, uh, contingency of of PMU outage of two, so you just increase the minimum bus observability of this to three, meaning at least three PMUs must observe that specific bus. So another consideration will be the line outages. Sometimes there will be fault in the lines, or like for example, uh, there are network switches for load curtailment, or other allowed eye landing wherein uh, part of the network is is controlled with a switch by uh, by completely disjoining it to the from the network or by online reconfiguration. For cases that uh, the the sub networks are completely disjoined, uh, network a uh, network uh, decomposition might be might be done in this in this case wherein as you can see here in Bus four and five, it is completely disjoint with the entire network, meaning no other connections is found from this subnetwork to the other network. So, in formulating this this line outages for the optimization problem, uh, since the line of three and four is not always is not always connected, so we will assume it as open. So, so as you can see from the second figure. Uh, we have omitted the 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 X2 and the the X3 for the bus 3 and 4 constraints. So meaning bus 4 can only be observed from uh, installing a PMU in bus 4 or in bus 5. So another important consideration would be the PMU channel limit. Most of the studies uh, usually assumes that a PMU, can, a PMU can monitor all the incident lines. But in reality, a PMU has a limited number of, of, of channels for, for monitoring incident lines. Like for example, uh, some PMUs may, may, may only uh, monitor one three-phase line or two three-phase line at, at most or something like that. So a PMU channel limit consideration is also important. Uh, in considering the channel limit, this this expands the the number of constraints even more. So let's say, for example, if you put uh, if you install a PMU in in bus two, so if you only have a channel limit of two for two lines, so you will have uh, an a two out of four combinations. So all possible combinations are 1, 3, 1, 6, 1, 7, and etc. So, as you can see, the problem becomes uh, larger. So, if you have, let's say, a, lar a large network, a uh, 100 bus network, your number of variables would be 100 variables and 100, uh, and 100 constraints. But with female channel limit, your, your number of constraints even grows larger. So, this is uh, this is computationally expensive, so there there is a need for us to to reduce the the search space for the optimization. Some of the techniques for OBP search space optimization is by the use of the zero injection buses, the lift buses, and our proposed non-branching bus series. So to start with zero injection buses or ZIBs are the buses wherein uh, there is no load connected or generator connected wherein uh, the current going in is the same with current going out. So with Kirchhoff's law, 
uh, if you if you put an PMU in bus seven, bus six is observable, which is in this case uh, zero injection bus. So it it extends our our observability to the next bus, which is uh, bus five, uh, based on uh, using the Kirchhoff's law. So for the leaf buses, these are the buses that is connected, or leaf buses, terminal buses, radial buses. There, these these are the buses connect connected connected only to the system by one line. So for example, uh, buses one, six, five, and nine are leaf buses because they have no other connection other than one line to the system. So if if you put a, if you install a PMU in these leaf buses, as you can see, uh, you may only monitor the their leaf parent or their their the adjacent bus. So in this case, buses three and seven are not uh, observed. So if if you if you install the PMU in the leaf parent bus, in this case, bus buses two, four, and eight. Uh, you are able to measure both the leaf and the adjacent buses of the leaf parent. So for leaf buses, we could predetermine the network uh, to have installed in the leaf parents instead of in the leaf buses. So for the non-branch, for the proposed non-branching bus series, this this. Uh, this custom system is actually very similar to 33, 33 bus IEEE system with minor modification. So let's say for this 40 bus system, a non-branching bus series is actually a, a series of bus which is, which is connected and non-branching, meaning uh, one, one bus connected after the other. So. Uh, the smallest NBS NBS C1 find is actually a single bus. So, from this given network, we have we have a number of NBS series, which is the 1, 19, 21 to 22, 23 to 27, 5 to 8, and etc. So, actually, this bus non-branching bus series could actually be reduced, and the placement for this for this uh, for these subsets of the network can be determ deterministically uh, place the PMU so no optimization is needed for these parts of the system so for for such NBSs uh, some of them can be actually reduced so as shown here the the NBS were in where it starts with bus 24 is actually reduced to one. This is for uh, bus observability of one and a PMU with at least two channels for for incident lights. So as we can see here, from earlier we have 40 bus network. It is reduced to an equivalent of 21 bus network. So. Earlier, I, uh, I have mentioned the zero injection buses, the leaf buses, and the NBS. So with the application of leaf buses and the ZIDs, we can actually predetermine some parts of the network. As in this case, uh, much of the buses of the network are already predetermined. So leaving us with only four buses to optimize. The, those are buses 3, 20, 11, and the equivalent of 12. Actually, uh, this reduces the need for optimization and almost uh, omits the need to optimize the problem. So actually, by inspection, we could already solve the problem. So with predetermined buses, like the leaf and leaf parent buses, we could already know that 23, 22, and other leaf parents should have a PMU installed, and the term, uh, we have found that we could we could also revert back these reduced NBS to their original form and uh, and uh, deterministically identify the, the necessary PMU locations. 
which is if we if we revert it back to the original network so uh, bus the equivalent bus of 24 is is reverted back to 25 26 27 and etc so with this from a 40 bus network uh, we actually reduce the amount of optimization needed down to four or if we only have four we could actually by inspection already solve the system so no for distribution systems uh, optimization might not be that ne might not that be necessary so in solving in solving the optimal in solving the optimal placement uh, solutions for the system there might be cases that there are several several number of solutions wherein the minimum number of PMUs is equal for for all of these solutions so we need somehow to to rank this solution which 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 is the which are the best uh, among these solutions one um, one commonly used index is the system observability redundancy index wherein it is actually the the summation of all the bus observability of the system it shows it shows you how much how much how many buses are are repeatedly observable in the system so as an example let's say for for solution a and solution b it has the same number of emus so the cost is the same but with system observability redundancy index, we can see here in solution A, buses one, two, three, and four is only observable once, which have a summation of four. And on solution B, if you place the PMUs in buses two and three, you will actually have a redundancy index of six, which is better. Since solution A, if you have a PMU outage in bus one, for example, buses 1 and 2 will not be observable. While in case of solution B, if you have a PMU outage, a single PMU outage of in bus 2, still buses 2, 3, and 4 are still observable. And for ranking the multiple solutions, uh, we we also uh, propose another, another index, which is the system observability redundancy variance, or SORB. Uh, uh, the goal of this this index is to minimize the minimize the the of the variance of observability between the buses. Meaning, we well, we need to uh, we need to as much as possible evenly distribute the redundancy among all the buses. So, in case in the first case in this left left figure, if three PMUs could actually monitor the bus one and another PMU would monitor bus 2, but a PMU 3 could actually monitor buses 1 and 2. So, in case we're, where we minimize the variance, PMU 3 is rather, will have, we would rather have PMU 3 monitor bus 2. So, in this case, we still have the same number of redundancy, but with minimum variance, meaning uh, as much as possible, uh, distribute the, the redundancy among all the buses. So the last part is the multi-stage PMU installation. So earlier we have already seen how to how to find the optimal PMU placement. Another is how to run the multiple solutions. But for a large system, let's say you have a 300 bus system and you, ne you need around 100 PMUs, but your budget only allows you for for this year, like for example, 30 PMUs. Next year, 20 PMUs, and so on. So you may want to install them by batch. So one common technique is by maximizing the system observability. So per batch of PMUs, uh, you will install batches of PMUs that gives you the maximum observability. As, in, as shown in this figure, uh, the first selected uh, batch batches are uh, the area covered by one, two, and so on. So in this, in this technique, you will see that some of the observable areas are disjoint. Some techniques used in this in this method are by uh, linear interpolation and and other similar techniques to solve the the other non-observable areas by numerical methods. And 
uh, uh, our and our proposed method is by maximizing the si system observability and to maintain the the continuity of the observable area. In this case, you are not only you are not only selecting the PMUs that gives you the the maximum observability, but you you also takes into consideration the continuity of your observable area. So in this case, one, two, three, four, five, until you reach the sixth batch, you will see that all the the area of the covered area or the observable area is all connected. Actually, the the algorithm behind this technique is is actually not the forward technique. It is actually done uh, in reverse by backtracking. First, uh, you remove the minimum the, by batch, you, you remove the the number of PMUs uh, wherein it will only decrease the, the observable system with uh, at the minimum. So first, you select 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. Because the problem with forward uh, greedy approach is that uh, you you may you, you may be able to to identify your your the next the next uh, possible batch wherein it will give you a large uh, system observability but for the next iteration after after your immediate iteration it may not give you the the most observability so so by backtracking by backtracking technique so it is assured that you will always gain the highest uh, observability every batch so that's it um, hello, so I'm Anton Santa Cruz and I'm a research fellow at the uh, Resilient Electricity Grids project. So for this um, presentation, I'll just um, give an overview of one, one possible um, fault localization process. So a full, a full fault localization process um, has a detection site classification, which, mean, which means um, determining what type of fault it happened, and finally, uh, determining where the fault happened. So basically for my presentation, um, first is we'll have an overview of um, the faults. Next will be um, my proposed fault localization process, process. And the process involves two main blocks, which is fault detection block, and fault classification and localization block. So, shunt faults are the unwanted connections in the system that are unwanted connections in the system. So basically, they are short circuit um, in the system, and it causes um, anomalies in the flow of current. So the usual causes are uh, vegetation, animals, lighting, and conductor clashing. So. Um, these faults um, has negative effects on the safety of the equipment as well as the people, and also it has um, um, induces um, power quality disturbances. So, if we have a certain interruption in the system, it may uh, lead to a huge economic loss for the consumers. And there are different types of um, faults, and it depend it depends on the combinations of the affected phases. So. You could see the spiral there that it, it creates a short circuit between two phases, so it's a line-to-line -line fault. So in a grid operation, basically you want to have a quick power restoration and network automation. And in order to have better grid operation, we want to have, um, we could have um, better fault diagnosis tools. Again, detection, classification, and localization. And some current methods are um, visual inspection, um, mapping or estimation using um, customer complaints, or by checking the status of the protective devices. And the problem there is it's time consuming. So for my proposed method is, I'll be considering the phaser measurements in the micro uh, PMU network and apply um, different methods such as um, signal processing, feature engineering, and machine learning. 
So basically, this is the um, approach. So again, from the micro PMU network uh, data, we determine that there's an anomaly in the system, and we determine if it's a fault or not. And at the detection um, block, we also acquire um, the significant information. And once we have those um, information, which are called the raw features, um, by the way, um, features is the same as variables. So once we have the once we have the features, the raw features, we pass it to the fault normalization model or the fault normalization block. And inside of it is we, we do feature engineering where we manipulate the raw features into more meaningful data, and we apply it to the um, classifier model, and then we have, we um, use the information of the fault type as well as the uh, feature engineered um, uh, variables to determine where the fault occurred. So basically, so the first thing in fault detection is to determine if that to determine if there is an anomaly that occurred in the system or an event that occurred in the system. So there are different types of fault, uh, of events. So as you could see, transformer energization, fault, uh, motor starting, um, capacitor switching, load switching, and etc. So we could see on the left um, their waveforms. So it's the voltage RMS, and I hope you could see that there are three um, waveforms for each um, graph, which represents the, th the three phases. So the first thing is to, to to have a detection of these certain events. So after de detecting those um, events, we do segmentation. So segmentation basically means we are um, we are um, well, we are segmenting the time series into different regimes. So for example, here we have five regimes. Um, so the first is the uh, sorry. So the graph shows a single phase um, voltage RMS, and in this um, waveform, we had um, a fault uh, occurred at uh, regime two. So we could see at the regime one that it's the pre-fault condition, and at the uh, regime two, we could see that uh, a fault occurred in the system, and the three, the third regime is the joining fault system of the system. So now we could um, look at the variations as well as the the transition segment two or the segment two in order to determine what the, um, type of event happened. So so now we could classify if it's a it's another event or it's a fault. So given that we have detected um, that it's a fault, we now could acquire the we, could, we now could acquire the certain information or the significant information in the waveform. So, so at this point now, we have detected the, that there's an anomaly. We have uh, uh, determined that it's a fault and we have acquired the significant information. So we pass it to the fault classification and localization block. So, just an overview. So these are the some of the methods that are being used. So one approach in fault classification and localization is the brute force method. So that, that's the one I said earlier. The problem is it's time consuming. Another method, some methods use traveling waves. So some of these methods require synchronized and accurate high frequency uh, data in time domain. And the impedance-based methods, some of the methods that use impedance-based models have many assumptions which should cause, um, um, which could affect the accuracy of the model. So for my proposed approach is to use machine learning algorithms or machine learning-based models to detect complex patterns in the system. And basically, um, machine learning is data-driven. So um, basically, we map x into y. In our case, we map um, 
we map the phasor measurements into determining the fault type and determining the fault location. So there are different um, machine learning methods. So I think all, most of us have used um, linear regression. So they consider that as a machine learning uh, model. There are other methods such as support vector machines, artificial neural networks, and etc. So after, before, before putting the um, the raw features into our machine learning model to do feature engineering, so let's look at this um, toy data set. So x is the feature or the variable, and y is the response. And given that we want to to fit a linear model. We could see that um, the linear model is not a good representation of um, mapping x into y. And what we want to do is, given that we want to do to use uh, linear models, we could transform x into log of x, and now we could create a uh, a better fit in the data set. So basically, that's feature engineering. We um, manipulate the data. So in our case, from the fault detection, we acquire the variations in the pre-fault and during fault. And we do feature engineering, and then feed, it, feed them to the classifier and localization models. So again, um, feature engineering is done to gain more, to have more meaningful data for a better for performance of the models. So there are different types of approaches of um, feature engineering. We could use uh, domain knowledge, uh, we could acquire the zero sequence components, large transformation, tensor transformation, and we could also use some basic um, data transformations or statistical transformations, such as linear, logarithmic, and principal components analysis. <coughs> okay, so given that we have acquired uh, the new information or the new extracted information from the raw features, we now do classification. So this is also a, a toy um, data set. So given that we have the exacted feature x1 and x2, and we could see the different types of fault plotted. So do every every dot is a sample or an instance of a fault. And given that we have a new instance, which is depicted by the triangular shape um, object, if you want to determine the fault type, we need to have a decision boundary. So basically, in classification, we create the decision boundaries in order to determine um, the fault type of new instances. And basically, for the fault localization, given that we have, um, in the x-axis, given that we have a certain fault engine, uh, feature engineered uh, variable, we could now map a new instance and determine uh, the fault distance. So basically, that's the main idea of my full fault lo localization process. So again, from the micro PMU network data, we detect if there's an event or if there's an anomaly, we segment the waveform, we determine if it's a fault or not, and then we, we acquire the significant information. And then feed them to the fault localization block we do feature engineering, we manipulate the raw features into more meaningful data, and then feed them to the classifier and localization model. So basically, that's the idea of my fault localization um, process. So that's all. Thank you. So hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm Ethel Luya. I'm a master's student here at UP EI. So my thesis, it's actually my um, I just finished my first year of MS, so um, my thesis focus now is on non-technical loss detection using data analytics. So this would be my outline for this presentation. So motivation, just an overview of non-technical loss, and then I'll show you the different um, literatures on data analytics solutions for non-technical loss detection, <coughs> and a summary of the presentation. So first, motivation. Of course, we all know that um, there is a system losses in our network. And the ERC has um, a threshold value where um, when that certain system loss can be charged to customers. 
In this graph, uh, the, the yellow line pertains to the, uh, the, the threshold value set by the ERC, which is 8.5 for private utilities and 13% system loss for electric cooperatives. And then the, the red lines, that pertains to the, um, from the, for the past few years, it has been observed that um, it averaged that the utilities can or have achieved um, system losses below that threshold value. And now, um, if you read some of the news, set, um, there's um, some of people in Congress and Senate are trying to push for a bill which lowers that system loss to 5% uh, for, pri for the private utilities and 10% for electric cooperatives. And what that translates to is that there's a projection of around 3.3 billion peso savings or around 0.12 pesos per kilowatt hour for Meralco customers and around 2.8 billion for um, electric cooperatives customers. This means that even 1% system loss already translates to billions of pesos paid by customers like you, like me, and everyone here in this room. So of course what we want is to, to decrease that um, the costs and we want to increase the savings for, for basically all the stakeholders. Um, by the way, disclaimer, if you think that some of these data are wrong, I'm willing to change this value, okay? So, so basically, um, system losses, it's actually um, divided into two. We have technical loss and non-technical non loss. So when we say technical losses, these are inherent in the system, but I'm focusing on non-technical losses. These are any consumed energy or services which is not built because of either measurement equipment failure or uh, an ill-intentioned and fraudulent manipulation of said equipment. So it comes in the form of um, tampering with meters, wiretapping, errors in technical loss computation, bribing meter readers, hopefully none of the corporate, uh, none of the utilities here, um, errors and delay in meter reading and billing. So from some of my research, um, I found that some of the approaches for NTN reduction set by the by utilities um, here in the Philippines include, of course, um, securing 100% bill collection, prevent power theft, meaning removing of illegal branch lines, um, getting customer reports, um, also installing meters instead of um, in individual houses, we put these meters and cluster them and put them in high pole so that it won't be easily accessible to any um, customers. And also install meters in iron boxes or of course replace, adjust, and repair defective meters. Specifically, um, for power theft uh, detection or um, prevention or detection of power theft, um, some methods include monitoring monthly uh, decrease, either abrupt or may, may that be a gradual decrease over, over months or over some years, or visual inspections from linemen, meter readers, and other concerned customers. Or if um, utilities have check meters, we connect that to a distribution transformer and um, look, check and balance that with the summation of the meters from the different loads or um, we can upgrade the energy meters to smart meters for better monitoring and as mentioned before, meter clustering. However, um, some of the issues that I guess I can point out with this method is that if you only monitor the monthly abrupt decrease, how about if that though you have seasonal patterns? What if, um, let's say you only um, do that during if you have customers only staying around summertime, if you have um, a high uh, price demand, a uh, high price electricity. And of course, visual inspect. if you only rely on visual inspections without any pre-processing notion, that is tedious and laborious. And for some utilities, check meters and installation of check meters is not um, always maximized, or it, it may be costly to have check meters in all the distribution uh, transformers. And additionally, um, here in the Philippines, you all know that not everybody has upgraded to smart meters. So that's why I am I'm proposing um, a data analytics solution to this non-technical loss detection. So why data analytics? is because we already have this 
um, initially we already have these monthly billings where there is a potential to increase efficiency in detecting this NPL by recognizing patterns or uh, and by, re by recognizing these patterns you can already filter out your customers and this will reduce your legal labor which can be used and, and this solution can already be used with any um, existing measurement infrastructures in the network. So here I will just discuss some of the uh, literature, published literature on, on the different approaches to non-technical loss detection. So first here is state estimation approach. So here, assuming that you know the network topology, you have smart meter readings for every customers. So that those are the, the V1, V2, V3, to V5, basically. And then what you do is you try to estimate the voltage at the, the VT corresponds to your voltage uh, in the distribution transformer. And if you have a deviation from those estimates from those different customers, then that, if you have high um, deviations, basically, or variance between those estimates, that can be flagged as a suspicious um, connection, or you have something wrong with the topology indicating that there's something wrong in the network. And then, you also have uh, this multivariate control chart where what they do is having, um, aside from the topology of the network, they also have a graphical information system, meaning they have the actual um, image of the of the layout of the the network, having those meter readings and having a pathfinding algorithm, they can pinpoint exactly which bus in the system um, is uh, exactly which part of the network has has um, the non-technical loss or a location of attack. And in this uh, publication, they actually the limitation is actually on cyber attack, meaning if they have smart meters. So next is, what if you just look at consumer pattern detection? So this could um, imply having, uh, using machine learning, which recognizes um, this energy consumption based on historical data. So this could be monthly energy consumption billing. If you have smart meters, they can be uh, in month minute resolution or hourly or daily resolution, depending on what you have. And um, other input data or features, as mentioned earlier, which can be type of customer, what is the peak demand, minimum, maximum per month, and, and all these things. And um, this was already uh, briefly tied. So basically, in machine learning, we have basically two types of approach. It's either a supervised or unsupervised learning. With a supervised learning, we know uh, we have knowledge of the output, meaning we know what is what the desired output, which meaning um, if I have this set of load profile, I want to classify it into theft or not theft. I want to classify it in the type of um, fault detection, the uh, fault type. So basically, that's a supervised learning. You have those data or you have those um, desired type of output. And you're predicting the class label or value. With an unsupervised, basically, if I only have those load profiles, I don't know which among these have a history of theft then hopefully with an unsupervised learning, you'd be able to cluster or se segregate this data and be able to identify that this group pertains to uh, anomalous customers, this group pertains to regular customers. Or possibly um, you have a cluster of maybe this is um, commercial loads, this is um, residential load types of profiles. So just a few examples of supervised learning algorithms include um, we have this uh, Pearson coefficient and Bayesian network uh, and decision tree. So what it does is in a Pearson coefficient, it's basically just finding the linear correlation between variables. So for this one, we look at the monthly billings and then the monthly consumption. And then as we see that actual uh, that decrease, that can be recognized by um, using Pearson coefficient. That, that actual decrease corresponding to a theft can actually be recognized. With a Bayesian network and a decision network, instead of just having that um, monthly load profile, I can have different features or input, including um, the active power, minimum, uh, maximum consumption, um, what's that, a number of readings I have um, for that customers. And then it will compute the probabilistic relationship between this input, and then it will determine, so most likely I will flag you as an anomalous customer because Based on this probabilistic computation, it says that 
there's an 80% chance that there's an anomaly in this um, in this customer. So another one is a support vector machine. So what it's just one of the I guess famous classifier for a supervised learning algorithm where it uh, you can classify. Um, there have been studies which classify slow profiles based if they have um, an anomaly in the network. So um, it deals with high dimensional data, meaning I can input 24 hour uh, daily, monthly, or I can even include these other input variables like the type of profile, maximum, minimum demand, and um, other things. So uh, just a uh, quick for an unsupervised learning. So the difference again is that in supervised learning, we know that we want the output of, have, of classifying it as a theft or not. With an unsupervised learning, the thing is um, algorithms like self-organizing map, k-means, fuzzy c-means, is that um, the basic idea is you have this per point corresponds to a certain customer. And then it would, this um, algorithms have, um, is able to compute or cluster this um, load profiles together. So it's up to you to do another step basically to, to know if that blue cluster corresponds to my theft or is it the green one or is the, the red one. So um, those are just uh, different steps or algorithms we do with um, data analytics for non-technical loss detection. So for some of the published basically, um, this is just a, a summary of some of the models used. So that's the SVM, the support vector machine. You have um, self-organizing maps, the genetic algorithms, neural networks. So basically, I'm just showing here that there are these are already published papers with um, collaboration with utilities in some countries like Brazil, Malaysia, Finland. So there is already a proof of this application of data analytics um, for non-technical loss detection. So basically, uh, this just shows the accuracy, meaning how well it, is it able to classify uh, my data, a precision, or a recall. So just a quick, uh, precision refers to to identifying the correct um, uh, theft, fraudulent customers over the actual number of cost, uh, um, for, uh, fraudulent customers. Basically, TP, TN, that's true positive, true negative, false positive, and false negative. So basically, in a classifier, um, when we say false negative and false positive, um, I think this is already self-explanatory that these are marked or labeled or classified um, wrong. So basically, for my research, it's actually focusing on machine learning for consumption pattern based, uh, for consumption pattern based machine learning, basically. And I am, I'm trying to um, uh, further develop the, the algorithm that it is applicable for actually existing infrastructures. Meaning, if you own, if the utility only has monthly billings, or if you have a mix of monthly or smart meter readings, or if you have, let's say, a network, um, a network data, basically. So I'm trying to 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 find that uh, algorithm, to design that algorithm that can take these different types of input. And, and be able to classify my load profile uh, if, there, if it's a theft or not. And part of that is, if uh, part of the goal basically also is to model theft behavior. So this is um, still a work in progress. So basically for this model, I'm just saying that what if I can compute the probability of how much a customer will steal given that um, this is how much I am willing to pay how much is how much am I going to actually pay? The probability of getting caught, what is the penalty, and all these other pro, um, variables that can uh, account of, of of how much I'm gonna steal. So basically, that uh, in conclusion, I haven't put any results <laughs> because um, this is basically still a work in progress. I have a poster outside. If you if you want a preliminary, basically, it's just very rough. It's still there's still a lot of improvement for that. But what I want to point out for this presentation is that data analytics can greatly reduce cost and effort in detecting um, NPL and a proof that um, more accurate NPL detection basically saves billions of pesos for all stakeholders, not just customers and also for the DU. So that's all. Thank you. So hello, everyone. Uh, I am your last 
the hope speaker for today. Uh, I hope that's good news. And I hope that's bad news as well because uh, our session, our sharing of innovation and our research in UP is about to end. And um, maybe uh, a brief overview uh, of what I wanted to say was basically that my, my work here is a bit misplaced. So actually, I'm supposed to be in uh, session two. So I'm in the energy analytics, but I'm going to explain why I'm here and maybe repeat what was already said in the session two. So it's a bit of a review and still generally an overview of what was discussed in session two. So my name is Christian. I'm currently a UP teaching associate here. Uh, and I'm also a master student. Uh, and my advisor is uh, Sir Alan, and I also have an advisor in Berkeley, and that's Ruth. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, what do I want to talk about? Well, I want to start with talking about the motivation of my research, <coughs> and then again, talked about the interruptible load program. Although it was discussed ago uh, a while ago, I'll still repeat it. So, just a brief uh, uh, re repetition of what was already said. And I'm going to discuss what I actually work on, which is my research, and that is short-term load forecasting. So it's not in the title, I apologize, my apologies for that, but what I actually wanted to say, what I'll be doing, and that's why I'm in the energy analytics, is because I'm doing load forecasting. Okay? <sighs> so background, uh, back in my undergrad uh, research project in UP, uh, my partner and I went to a uh, rural, rural area here in the Philippines and a recurring thing that we said there was that there were no roads and that's why there are no electric lines. But then they said, some people said, well, there's no electric lines because there are no roads. So it's a sort of, it's a weird, yeah, it's a, it's a chicken or egg question. It's a chicken or egg question. So what comes first, the progress? Where is the growth? Where does electricity go? So does the electricity go first before the progress? So we recognize there that there's a sort of chicken egg predicament. And maybe it asks us and it begs us to ask that question, how does our country grow and how do we maybe answer that chicken or egg question? So uh, how does our country grow and it's an effect on our demand? Okay. So we do recognize that we have economic growth and then we have an energy demand. But we have a cycle. and so let's let's look at that cycle. So we have economic growth, increased investments. Let's make it the first one. Let's let's say that's the first one. That's in the necessity. And then we have business expansions, infrastructure development. And then if you have this, of course, definitely your demand will increase. And then the cycle continues on and on and on. Okay. So with that, we have strategies. And if the if the demand grows, of course, the power industry must follow. We must build plants, we can employ supply-side uh, solutions, but we also recognize that in the, in the newer uh, uh, research areas, demand-side responses. Okay. So we have the electric power system, and how do we increase our energy capacity? Okay. So we have that uh, power system here, and you can see the overview of the power system. We have the generators, transmission lines, and the customers of transmissions. Okay. And if you want to increase our energy capacity, the classical solution would be to construct new power plants. Okay, so we, we, want, we construct new power plants, we build our capacity. That's the standard classical solution. Although uh, in, in most cases, it might be a slow process, but that is our response to growth in demand. And then with, when an energy capacity grows, we have to improve our infrastructure, uh, our power system, of course, Increasing demand wherever it goes, we must also improve what's already there. Otherwise, it won't, it won't be able to handle growth. And lastly, demand side, which is what I really want to focus on, is actually we are able to control uh, the customer loads and maybe we can maybe control more embedded generation. So these uh, key ideas here uh, fall under the more smart grid paradigm. Okay, But... Uh, we did, did, in, in this slide, uh, we are offered uh, options. And for today, I would just like to stress that I've been working on the demand side. So these are some just the statistics that I took from the uh, Department of Energy. And these are the electricity sales and consumption per grid. 
And we can see here the breakdown of residential, commercial, uh, industrial, others' own use. And what this slide says here that this is the consumption we have. Okay? But what's hidden here? What's hidden here? Well, what's hidden here is the own use. So if we don't, if, it, if, we, if we recognize what that is, that's basically uh, the generators owned by the companies who consume energy. So these are more, these are the backup generators uh, that the industry, uh, the industrial plants, commercial buildings have. So these are the, uh, some, in, in most cases, is what they use uh, in backup, okay? And then we do recognize, as I was discussed before, as a while ago, that the peak demand does increase, and then there's some, just some data there that the peak demand will definitely increase and increase and increase. And the problem is, if we're not able to plan ahead, or, or we are unsuccessful to provide ourselves with new capacity using supply-side solutions, maybe demand-side solutions can offer you better options. And that is, it. maybe I can control the own use, maybe I can access the untapped generation capacities of all the malls here that have their storage, uh, solar plants that they're not using. Maybe I can use that as demand side management strategy. Maybe what I can do is, okay, during the supply deficiency, I'll, I'll tell the malls here, okay, you use your own power and then we'll disconnect from you. And they will just pay you. And that's basically the intractable program. We are, we're asking the customers, Okay, uh, disconnect from us, use your own backup generators for your own, uh, of course, for good continuity of your services, but we'll disconnect. And then when it's okay to return back to our system, well, it's all good, but we'll pay you. Okay, so there's an the incentive there, and that's actually what was discussed uh, initially in uh, session two. They were discussing how you will basically incentivize or uh, give the customers a better or more of a better option, a better contract. You want them to bite to that offer, okay? So definition, interruptible load program, and the motivation for controlling customer loads. So the interruptible load program is defined as a demand side management strategy implemented during power supply deficiency to maintain system stability through the curtailment of end user loads. This is a shorter definition as uh, was discussed from uh, Sir Alan's slides. But here in the Philippines, the Department of Energy and the Energy Regulatory Commission helped establish this program and it's supported by the electric utilities. Okay, so we do recognize that this is not really new here in the Philippines. Uh, we've been working on this, but here in UP, we'll also be working on, working on this and we look forward to having more collaborations in the future. Okay, so inside, so interruptible load and visualizing the load. Okay. So just a brief recap of what I've been discussing. I, I, I discussed the background of the research, then just set the stage for uh, the concept of the interruptible load program. Now I'm going in deeper the interruptible load program. So we have this sample system, uh, power substations in there, and a bunch of nodes. And of course, uh, just by looking at the, the diagram, we don't recognize customers. Maybe we can identify if we're very, uh, uh, the term is uh, well suited to understand the system that you have in your electric cooperative or not. Okay, so you can identify which part there may be a commercial area, a residential area, industrial area. Maybe you can identify some of the nodes there as your high use industrial plants, those customers that uh, you pay be to provide them with much more power and much more uh, detail of uh, service. Okay, but Let's ask the five W's. And in the interruptible load program, uh, who, what, when, where, why, and who is the residential, commercial, industrial? They are the ones we are. We want them to provide their loads for us. So why residential? Uh, in in the Philippines, they said, uh, okay, uh, there is a, uh, we want the service to be. We we want to disconnect those who are able to fend for themselves, and usually residential don't have that ability. But we do recognize that we are shifting towards a uh, smarter grid, so we're not removing that option yet. Maybe think about of a micro grid, maybe. Maybe a group of residentials, a community, have their uh, well-suited uh, electric cooperative that they have. They have micro grid, uh, and they have generators, so they, and then maybe we can consider them as a bulk. Now that's a micro grid, that's a residential profile of a load, but 
they can be part of the interrupt overload program. Okay? So we do recognize that we're not uh, essentially, we're not excluding anyone out yet. We want to include all of them. We want to study all of the load profiles. So of course, commercial in, uh, commercials, uh, load profiles, typical, uh, they, they do have backup generators, most of them. Uh, and the industrial, of course, these are the large customers. Uh, they definitely it's for the continuity of their service. Okay? And what do we want to do? We want to curtail their load. Of course, uh, that's what we want to do. When, when? Well, upon request or upon requirement. Where? Well, in the distribution system, of course, but a spatial disconnection is another thing. I'm not looking into that yet. Okay? So, <coughs> why? To maintain system stability. And again, we, all, we almost always do this during supply deficiencies, which is around 12 hours in a year. That's a really short time, but it saves us a lot of uh, headache because we're able to maintain the system stability. Okay? Visualization. What we want to see. So I have these two graphs here, and basically they're industrial loads, and there are two, two lines there, pre-interruptible load and interruptible load. Okay? So we can recognize that the pre-interruptible load, of course, there's no interruption, and then the interruptible load, there is an interruption. Okay? What, what do we want to take away from this? Well, when the interruptible load is in action, what do we want to see? Of course, the pre-interruptible load goes to that waveform interruptible load there. But we have several considerations. That is the timing. When do we initiate it? Of course, uh, those who decide on the timing uh, should know a lot about optimal dispatching. Of course, uh, other mathematical requirements for uh, really knowing that. But in most cases, the timing is when the peak will happen. Okay? And that's when you need it. So the response is, of course, the curtailment of the interruptible load. Simple effect in this reduction of demand. So, uh, in hindsight, what we're actually doing here, or what we want to study here is, we want to make sure that when we when that thing happens, everyone is well compensated, and we're doing it in the most effective, in the most efficient way. So that's what we want to do. <coughs> so this is the interruptible load program framework. So we have uh, electric utility or cooperative, or a retail electricity supplier, interacting with customers or customer loads. And then the customer contracts on his load to be disconnected, and then the electric uh, utility offers reduced electricity by reduced electricity tariffs through contracts and uh, specialized uh, contract. And then the customer loads can be, uh, again, analyzed more on the cost modeling, contract design, and the load characteristic, where we have your load reliability, load forecasting, load clustering. I'll go more on this. Uh, more later. Okay. So support, I think it begs the question, what makes an effective interruptible load program? And again, the key to our success is working together. So we have the government, well, you have your pol policy planning and regulation, and we definitely need that. <coughs> we have the electric utilities and the industry, implementation, market and grid management. And those things are necessary for us to succeed. Of course, uh, Although those two are sometimes quite enough, academic research and innovation provides us with some more exciting and sometimes more simple ways to do things that were already done. Okay? And then of course, the end user loads. We don't neglect them. This is what we're talking about anyway. The end users, the interruptible load availability. Okay. Research. So now let's go into knowing what to study, expanding our knowledge and expertise. So we've discussed interruptible load program definition, interruptible, uh, the key to, success, to succeeding in the interruptible load program. But now let's move on to the more academic side of interruptible load programs, and that is the research. Okay? So expanding our knowledge and expertise, so we have planning, economic, and engineering. So planning, policy development, regulations, regurgitation of what was mentioned a while ago. Economic, design of contracts, ancillary service markets, optimal dispatching, basically uh, more on the economic side, more on providing a fair exchange between these two components here. Okay, and engineering, the load forecasting and the load clustering. So these are just uh, not, uh, not uh, some, oh, sorry. It's, it's not complete, uh, it's just a uh, overview or it's just a uh, initial investigation of the expertise and knowledge here in the load uh, interruptible load program. 
So, uh, again, going into what my research is actually, so going back to this slide, what I actually focus on for my initial research is load for casting. And I plan to work on load clustering next. But going more onto the details of load for casting, load for casting is a technique used by power energy proponents, organizations to predict the energy demand, to meet the demand and supply equilibrium. So in the Rectorable Road Program, we forecast the entropical capacity. And if, if, if that doesn't make sense, basically, we're forecasting how much of the customer's loads we can rely on. That's basically it. So uh, let's say I want you to, uh, let's say I want you to remove this load, this amount of megawatts from your consumption, and then the customer say, okay, I don't have that much. But, but we don't, we, if you haven't done enough forecasting, you might have that problem. But if you, if you have done forecasting, uh, you can say, okay, I know that at this time, this might be your consumption. So I can expect you to remove this much load. So that's the idea of load forecasting in the interruptible load program. Now this is necessary because uh, uh, the, co the contracts that we're offering here in the Picari uh, project, they're not static. It means uh, the, the amount of interruptible load capacity and the incentive is more of a dynamic. Uh, meaning that we have, uh, we, don't, we don't have a fixed amount per customer. So it's, we don't have customer A, this is all the time, this is the one that you'll be removing. So it depends. So it must have a, that sort of dynamic activity there. Okay, so we in load forecasting we have a time horizon consideration and that is short term, medium term, and long term. So long term uh, is the around 10 to 20 years, five, uh, five, 10 years. Medium term, uh, less than five years. Short term, week ahead, far ahead. So in the interruptible in the interruptible load program, our main consideration is the short term time horizon. You want to work on. Uh, knowing what the interruptible capacity is to next hour, uh, next week, probably, okay? So, <coughs> research, predicting future demand. So, short-term load forecasting research is basically divided into this uh, four broad main. So we have statistical techniques, uh, we have regression models, financial smoothing, autoregressive models, dynamic modeling, state space models, I'm just uh, saying this, I was already in the slide, but uh, the point is there are a lot of things, there are a lot of math that can go into it. Uh, but what I've been working on is actually Gaussian processes, the ones that highlighted there. And this is what Rule was working on and this is why I focus on this. Okay. So my method, Gaussian processes for forecasting, machine learning algorithm. So this is my method, if you see my poster, uh, in front, this is actually just basically what's written there. So we have data acquisition, data validation, of course. And then the key idea for Gaussian processes is just actually Gaussian model selection. So we have these functions similar to our parametric functions that we, we have models, okay? But here in Gaussian processes, it's a slightly different, but still basically the same. We have this uh, data, we want to model it. This is just a way of doing it, okay? So uh, again, the main point here is not actually to go into the methods. The methods are interchangeable. Whichever is more accurate at the first certain time, then just change it, okay? We don't want to rely on one method all the time. Just want to showcase what I've been doing, okay? So, uh, example of my R ahead forecasts. <coughs> so it's not actually uh, a perfect forecast, but it's a good forecast. So I have this data here, January, February, 2013. And uh, I got this data actually from Pecan Street, data port. Uh, I think Claire mentioned that a while ago. So I, I, I did the same. Uh, I, I extracted data uh, from Pecan Street, uh, applied some interruptible load concepts on it, and mainly on the decision making of how much capacity to forecast and whatnot, okay? But uh, as you can see here, uh, the error bars are mentioned, like, are there, the second row, okay? and. The middle line separates the test data from the from the sorry from the training data to, to from the validation set. So the left of the blue dashed line is the the training data that I use. So we do recognize that uh, minimal error there. 
but once of uh, once I uh, now predicted uh, validation sets, uh, well, you can see error. It's not a perfect forecast, and definitely we can work on improving it through the remodeling of these equations here. So these are the, just some of the equations that I tried to model. Basically, I, I just used my expert knowledge. What, what what thing what seems to fit, and that's actually what you do all the, all the time when you have forecasting. You guess. This is my guess. It's not a perfect guess, but it's a good enough guess because it was able to follow the trend of the forecasts. Okay. So, highlights. I'm almost done. So what did I discuss? I well, I discussed demand side management. It was discussed several times. I hope uh, you already understand fully what it means. Interruptible load program, curtailment of end user loads, and short term load forecasting which is what I did, okay? And yeah, I think that's that's basically it. I want to end with a uh, quote. Collaboration allows us to more know no more than we are capable of knowing by ourselves. So uh, in part, we have this program here in, in UP, uh, and we sometimes we're, we're getting lonely uh, just working by ourselves. We want collaboration with, of course, electric utilities, cooperatives, government, okay? So I think this quote summarizes our feeling. Of course, we, we know we can know a lot by ourselves, but if we work together, we can know a lot more. Okay, so I hope uh, the start of this uh, seminar is just, wait, sorry, the, the se this seminar is just the start of our collaboration, okay? So I think that ends my discussion. Thank you for listening. Uh, I just like to seek clarification on the load forecasting. Yes. So you are forecasting the amount of load that you can curtail. Yes. Is that per customer? Yes. Uh, actually, uh, I I think I can answer that better. But I did not discuss load clustering. Okay. So uh, load. Your your question talks about uh, interruptible capacity and it's per customer, right? So the answer is roughly yes. But the customer is a is sort of how do you understand the customer? What who is that customer? Okay. So what did I forecast? So uh, I did not discuss it in the slides. Maybe I can allot uh, two min two minutes. So we do recognize that uh, there are very different types of load profiles, right? So in a system, we have a customer I residential, commercial, uh, industrial, and then uh, well, residential of course very low. Load right. So is that uh, very low load? So what did what what can you do? Well, you have to say what can you do? You have to add them up to form what I call an interruptible capacity. So for example, uh, a customer can be a community that have the same profiles, and that's where the load clustering comes in. Uh, in this uh, very different uh, customer load profiles of a certain uh, community at a certain place with different profiles there, we want to group together those that are very similar and then add them up. And then when you add them up, then you have your customer, quote unquote. And that is what you forecast. So uh, uh, it can be divided into uh, roughly industrial, residential, and commercial. So I think uh, that's the, the answer is roughly yes to your question. Any other applications? Yeah. The learning on the non-technical non loss detection requires knowing beforehand who the, to, to train the data requires knowing where are the cases of non-technical loss. So yeah, um, yes sir, for the training of the, the algorithm basically, um, if it's better for me, yeah, I prefer if I have at least um, a labeled data of historical of who may have had the uh, history of um, tampering or any type of NTL um, detection. But if there is none, basically, then that's the time I'm gonna shift basic to an unsupervised learning. So for um, the way um, I unders uh, the way I know um, that algorithm, then um, even without knowing this. Um, um, who among these customers have theft, then I can still uh, 
train that um that unsupervised I can still apply my unsupervised learning, but the validation would need to come from an actual um validation. So that's the hard part with if I'm just gonna do an unsupervised learning, I also need uh, validation to know the actual accuracy for for that. Yes. Follow up on that. Yes. Uh, do you plan to engage uh, uh, maybe a partner utility to to test your uh, your uh, thesis? Um, actually, sir, as part of the Picari project, we're partnered with um the corp right now. So hopefully, um, so from the fellow, <laughs> um, ideally that's the kind of data that I'm actually hoping to have. It's either if whether you have a monthly data or a, a fifteen minute data. Then, if you don't have any labeled um, customer profile, which is an NTL, that's that. That is also why one of my objective is to model theft behavior. So at least I have a probabilistic, um, uh, a statistical approach on which I can generate synthetic theft data, and then that's the time that um, I can apply if I'm not going to have any validation. So, let's see. Uh, another one. So in, in terms of uh, accuracy, do you think that uh, having a 15-minute uh, reading of the customer through smart meter will improve the accuracy than just a monthly billing uh, without any information on the per 15-minute per uh, profile? Um, for right now, what I think, um, yes. Um, ideally, because we um, with a daily resolution, you have a better idea of the patterns per day. So what if, if you have customers that only, let's say, um, tap during the day or at night because they know the, the schedule of um, utilities going around for visual inspections, then you have this, that fluctuating pattern which, cannot, which is not seen if you only have the monthly data. But um, what I want is that even if I only have even if I don't have that 15-minute resolution, then ideally I can still apply this um, data analytics approach and look at and look at these monthly billings for let's say around two years to have a better understanding of what's the regular or norm um, consumption of a certain customer. Uh, following to that uh, question, uh, do you think that uh, by installing a check meter, whether it is a a uh, regular or a smart meter okay. will improve the, uh, the prediction model. Well, yes, of course, because that would be additional data, and that is in check meters as is used for basically check and balance. So if you have that check meter in the distribution utility, and then the summation of your meters for your each customer so does not um, equate that. Then that, then that initially is already um, a first filter or a flag that in this feeder there is more chances of having um, non-technical loss um, in that network, basically. Yes, sir. Uh, you are talking on about NPL on the consumer side. How about those non-technical losses? Uh, being contributed by the, the same uh, power, can yeah. So how, how will you incorporate that in your study? So, I'm sorry, again, like what type of NPL, sorry? Uh, your study, I think, is uh, concentrated only on the non-technical loss for uh, uh, consumers. Yeah, yes, sir. So there's no correlation when you study a certain feeder with respect to the foreign materials touching the lines. So it's not included in that, in that study. Sure. Um, right now, the scope does not include that, sir. But that's actually, but that is part of um, future works, if possible, because ideally, non-technical loss is, does not only account for theft. Actually, what if you have um, basically um, cost of basically un unregistered um, connection, so that you won't actually have billings for these types of customers. So. Um, and you have also this, what if equipment failures are also type of non-technical losses? Um, if you have delayed um, readings or billings, so some already also classify that as non-technical loss. But for my scope as of now, it only pertains to 
customer and consumption. So you cannot uh, fully study the, the feeder, non-technical loss, the loss on the feeder. Because there are other factors aside from the consumer. Uh, say, the non-technical loss being due to bill breaks. Yes, sir. Or is the need to give a closing remark? Sean already did it for me. <laughs> uh, first and foremost, I would like to uh, thank everyone for joining us uh, for the entire day. We are, well, we are happy that the, the crowd at the start is, uh, well, the crowd right now is even bigger than the crowd when we started this morning. And uh, uh, what we have presented is just a background of what we're doing here in UP. And as, I, as we have mentioned, it's just a start. Um, so we hope that we're able to meet our objective that we want to impart with you what we're doing um, for the uh, people in the, say, the government. Um, this is uh, a way of preempting that we are developing solutions and the project is just on its first year. We have another year to go. Perhaps next year we will have another uh, a similar uh, session like this and we can now report the results. Uh, by that time, we have deployed the PMU and rolled out or simulated the interruptible load contract framework using actual data. So we, uh, we would have data by then. We would have results by then. But Again, for this work to progress, we need the help of everyone. So, for example, the fact that you are contracting uh, demand side, we need the help of the regulators to, to approve such uh, uh, such uh, uh, process for it to be to, to happen to roll out. Um, for the electric utilities, um, we are seeking partners uh, because. The research that we're doing will not progress if it's only confined in the laboratory and just end up as a publication that will sit in our uh, shelves. So we are, we will be very glad if, uh, you, you, if we could get in touch with you and we could build relationships with you, not only for this project but other projects as well. Uh, for the those coming from the different universities, uh, again, thank you for also uh, for for joining us. Um, and I hope that this is uh, this was an opportunity for you to, to see what, what we are doing and perhaps you could get inspiration as well on, on what you could do. And we are open to, to working with universities. One of the objectives of the Pikani project is to have the higher learning institutions, not only three universities, but a lot of universities to get involved and to benefit. In fact, uh, we were required by, by CHED to partner with universities. So right now, uh, the Corp is a partner and we have already talked to uh, wait na, uh, Pangasinan State University. I am about to say Matangas State. <laughs> Pangasinan State University. And uh, we, are, we are still uh, in the process of uh, sorting out the type of partnership that, uh, that uh, we will pursue with them. So again, thank you very much. Um, again, it's just a start. Um, there are several people who ask for copies of presentations. Um, you may get in touch with us through the, through the way we got, got in touch with you through that email address. Uh, we will set up a repository where we will where we'll put all the presentations so you can download them. Um, I really apologize to the students because I wasn't able to mention that we made posters and the posters were displayed outside for, for everyone to see. We will make the PDF copies of the posters available also in, in that repository. So I also would like to thank Sasha Thomas for flying over. Sasha, the work just started. This is day one of four days of work. <laughs> and I'm sure you're going to enjoy the weather. You will adjust with the weather soon. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. And. Um, we hope to see you again uh, next year. We will. Uh, this is encouraging. So we're going to do it again. It's a big turnout. Again, thank you very much.